Our second reading this morning comes from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, beginning at verse 36. Now in Joppa there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time she became ill and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there sent two men to him with the request, Please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. And When he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. The word of the Lord. On Tuesday, January 12th, 2010, at 4.53 p.m., a catastrophic magnitude 7 earthquake struck the nation of Haiti near Port-au-Prince. By January 24th, at least 52 aftershocks measuring 4.5 or greater had been recorded. The Haitian government reported that an estimated 230,000 people had died 300,000 had been injured, and 1 million made homeless. They also estimated 250,000 residences and 30,000 commercial buildings had collapsed or were severely damaged. An estimated 3 million people were affected by these quakes. The day following the initial quake, during a television show, a prominent Christian broadcaster proclaimed that the Haitian people were to blame for this tragedy because of their sin. Do you believe that he was right? Did God will the hurricane to strike the Haitian people to punish them? Yet, if this broadcaster is wrong, how do you make sense of this tragedy? How does God work in the world, and how can we say with any confidence if an event in history is or is not the will of God. For example, consider your own life. How do you perceive God's presence? Does God inflict suffering and pain on you to punish you when you sin and grant you peace and prosperity if you obey him? We certainly live in a world where societies use force to punish offenders and, in theory at least, seek to reward good behavior. Yet, if this is how God operates, how do we make sense of Jesus Christ, who was faithful to God yet was poor, homeless, and suffered a humiliating death? Or how do you explain the suffering of the early church at the hands of the prosperous but pagan Roman Empire? Or how do you account for the bombs that ripped through the crowds at the Boston Marathon and caught last Monday and caused such terrible devastation. Indeed, if the people of Haiti somehow brought the quakes on themselves because of their sins, how do you explain all the innocent children, aid workers, and for that matter, Christians in Haiti who died, were injured, or lost loved ones in that earthquake? Were they collateral damage? No. Another answer is needed to understand tragedies such as the earthquake in Haiti or the bombing in Boston. Now, like us, the early church struggled trying to recognize and respond to the will of God. So when Tabitha, the only female called a disciple in the Bible, died, the church had to decide how to interpret her death. Was it God's will that she had died? After all, she had died of an illness. The church would no doubt have prayed to God to save 
such a faithful witness to Jesus Christ. Yet, despite any prayers or supplications by the church, Tabitha died. And the fact that she was the only female called a disciple in the Bible raised another consideration. Did her death represent the judgment of God? That is to say, had Tabitha broken the order of God's creation by assuming the leadership role of a disciple in the church, did God then restore the natural order by causing her death and thereby rid the early church of female leadership? In other words, should I join the Christian broadcaster who blamed the Haitians for the earthquake and proclaim that God had willed her death as a punishment for sin? No, indeed nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, far from ruminating or on whether or not God was passing judgment on Tabitha, the early church quickly sent for Peter after her death. Peter came immediately and after praying, called on her to arise. And in raising Tabitha from her deathbed, God confirmed what the early church already knew. Tabitha was truly a disciple of Jesus Christ and God's will for her and all followers of Christ is new life and not death. Yet how did the church know and act on the truth even before God raised her? Earlier in the book of Acts, a husband and wife had misrepresented their support of the church and had died. Yet the church acts in complete confidence that God had not caused Tabitha to die. Why? Well, first of all, the church affirmed the call of Tabitha as a disciple of Christ because of her devotion to good works and to acts of charity. As Christ had told the church earlier, every good tree bears good fruit. So by observing the fruits of her ministry, they were confident that she was indeed and had indeed been called by God to be a leader in the church as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Yet the church had a second reason to affirm that the death of Tabitha did not represent the punishment of God. And that reason is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, if we learn nothing else from the cross of Jesus Christ, we learn this. By choosing the way of the cross of Christ, God does not in any way coerce our faith in Christ or punish those who crucified him. Instead, Christ takes the burden of sin upon himself and forgives them. And since the cross of Christ, God does not resort to force in order to punish non-believers, but instead works through the church in order to reconcile enemies of God into believers through faith in Jesus Christ. And I believe that the scripture affirms that God accomplishes this work without resorting to violence. Yes, a day of reckoning will come, and we will all have to give an account of how we have spent this gift of life. But for now, God works through the church for healing healing of the world rather than striking back at offenders. On the cross, Christ takes the sin of the world on himself. Likewise, if we learn nothing else from the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we learn this. God's will is for new life, and nothing, not even suffering and death, can frustrate his will to grant his church new life. Therefore, I do not believe that God sent the earthquake to punish the Haitian people for their sins or anything like that. Instead, the cross of Christ teaches us that for now at least, God works to redeem the world without violence. And the resurrection of Christ teaches us that no tragedy, whether a natural disaster or act of terrorism, can frustrate God's will for new life. Still, the fact is that we live a precarious existence on earth and tragedies such as the earthquake that hit Haiti or the bombs in Boston can strike any nation at any moment. 
But rather than dividing us further in the world, such tragedies can awaken us to our common humanity, our common frailty, and our common need for mutual support. Further, by raising Tabitha, God also affirms the ministry of the church to the poor and confirms that God is indeed on the side of the downtrodden in order to bring new life. So in the face of tragedies, from natural disasters to acts of terror, let us seek to be a blessing to all in need, to speak up for the widow and the orphan rather than to blame them for their suffering. Let us share God's blessings with all as generously as God has been with us. All the while, of course, human evil, natural disasters and the like are still capable of inflicting violence on us. Yet the resurrection of Christ shows us that God's will is for reconciliation. And the cross of Christ confirms our hope that there is no human evil, no natural disaster, no violence that another can inflict on us that can frustrate or change God's will for new life or undermine our confidence in God's ability to carry out his saving will. The light has shined in the darkness, and the darkness has not and never will overcome it. Let all God's people say,